it is a safe test in post mi period but keep your eyes open keep your eyes open be alert be there with the patient so this is a typical uh, study which is being done for example with the s1 only with the single extras then you in introduce the s2 the s3 uh, and with the s3 so what is so this is what was happening you were not able to induce any of the arrhythmias however oh thank you so with over here what is happening in the last series what we can see over here is this extra is being introduced and later on the patient tends to develop a inducible ventricular tachycardia at a cycle length of 220 to 220 milliseconds so that's the reason how much number of extra stimuli are you able to use and what with how much frequency as well you are able to pace it really makes a big difference ecg is one of the oldest one of the cheapest and also widely available however we need to be able to be able to identify those ecg markers okay dr prashant already said it uh, his uh, electrophysiologist is able to see them and tell it where is the possible mutation as well so we need to be a little bit more careful as well whenever we are seeing in the ecg so what are those markers where uh, which can uh, give us a little bit of hint is parameters like the microwave t wave time microvolt t wave alternance if there is qrs fragmentation for example qrs fragmentation why so it has already been shown those areas which is confined to that uh, artery coronary artery for example if someone has had a inferior infarct so chances are high that area if you will try to see in the ecg leads corresponding to that area there may be fragmented qrs as well similarly qrs duration so higher is the qrs duration chances of that person developing a certain cardiac death or even certain cardiac arrest may be much much more higher similarly there is another concept what is called a signal averaged ecg or in the form of ventricular late potentials for this concept the evidence is not yet strong we were also trying to do for some of the patients uh, we have tried it but i was not also so much convinced about it so i think we all should wait for some more concrete data to come up before we start uh, recognizing those parameters as reliable parameters for the sudden cardiac death so one of the uh, big confusion what happens is about this parameter so what is happening is when you will be seeing on the ecg there will be a beat to beat change so a lot of times we start thinking oh this is sinus arrhythmia the patient is breathing in breathing out so that's a pretty common uh, change and all not at all so what had happened is there, there was uh, there were several studies as well in which when they tried to see so they noticed the it is a significant marker of electrophysiological vulnerability and in fact so much so that it is one of the strongest predictor for the arrhythmic events in fact so this is how it looks like so for example if this is the surface ecg recording and when you try to do the beat separation so this is the average beat however this is how it looks like over here so it might look on a single beat it might be looking something different however if you will try to uh, do the analysis and all definitely the average beat will most commonly look slightly different so um, a lot of times they say what about if someone is already taking some medicine so for example if someone is taking a beta blocker they have even showed for this parameter if you are trying to investigate it does not get affected if someone is taking a beta blocker in fact however uh, one of the common confusion tends to happen is some if there is a ischemic cardiomyopathy patients so there is no significant role for this parameter in fact now coming to the autonomic indices so dr deepak was there already he has been speaking about it quite a lot in detail so we are aware that there are other things for example if you try to look for the heart rate variability otherwise if someone is having a higher heart rate otherwise heart rate turbulence is there so we start thinking that oh there is some autonomic dysfunction and this person may also be having a higher or lower risk of the sudden cardiac death unfortunately there is no correlation at all for this parameters in fact if uh, some patient is there with having autonomic dysfunction yes uh, they will be having a higher mortality however for the just for the risk of arrhythmias no conclusive evidence is there so far so one of the valuable 
diagnostic approaches, which is really, really helpful. Echo is there, ECG is there. Other than that, cardiac MRI as well. So in that, especially delayed gadolinium enhancement tends to enhance the visualization of the, not just infarct area, but also the peri-infarct area. Uh, of course, those infarct areas tend to happen in those patients who have had the myocardial infarction. And if you notice, there's a mid-wall fibrosis uh, especially in the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy setting as well, those patients are the ones who will not just have a reentrant mechanism because even in arrhythmias as well, there are different mechanisms are there. So most likely they will be having reentrant mechanism of arrhythmia and also a higher risk for the sudden cardiac death. And a lot of times we start measuring uh, about the infarct size with the echo or maybe even with the ECG's parameters as well. However, if you tend to measure it using a cardiac MRI, it's much better predictor even compared to the ejection fraction. So maybe with the ejection fraction, someone is having 20, 25%, but if someone is not having any scar, chances of that person developing a, a lethal arrhythmia or having a higher chances of sudden cardiac death is much, much less, in fact. So uh, one of the other important things is like what is called as non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy patients. So in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, so there will not be much of scar and all. However, if you do the cardiac MRI, if you see those mid-wall fibrosis, be careful. Warn your patients, you have to start taking care of them in a much better way. So this is a cardiac MRI. I'm so sorry for the poor quality of this image. So they try to do a gadolinium intake. So this is the one which is showing the defective uptake. And so for, on the basis of that as well, you can risk stratify those patients. So there are also important biomarkers, but these biomarkers are not very specific. Why? They are not very specific for the sudden cardiac death. Those biomarkers are more, more or less like a, just a response, an adaptive response of the heart to the stretching. So uh, those hormones will be also getting, uh, coming out in the form of like uh, troponin, uh, which is there in the form of the myocardial infarction. The BNP, the BNP as well is there already for the heart failure, even for atrial fibrillation as well. Recently, uh, one of the studies had come in fact as well. So there are some non, uh, not major fight, uh, factors like the galactin-3 or the soluble ST2 as well. We already spoke about the genetics in quite a lot of detail, but to summarize it a little bit, uh, we need to have a look on the positive family history, about the uh, lamin genes, LMNA genes and all. Of course, those are the ones which are associated with uh, predisposing those patients for higher risk. Okay, now we know those patients are predisposed for a higher risk. What are we going to do? Has the management changed? So Sir was already pointing it out so well that in earlier days we had been depending only on the autopsy or the post-mortem. But now with, there are other tools as well. So similarly, even for the management as well, there are now newer tools. So what are those newer tools? ICDs and all are there. So similarly, there is a, like a temporary wearable ICD, you can say it like this. So, but it is not implantable. So this is more of a wearable form. In the form of a, it is a non-invasive. So for example, if someone is having a higher risk, but for a limited time. So for example, for uh, just three months. So what would you do? put up a wearable ICD, in fact. But there is also a little bit of controversy with this. What is the biggest controversy with this is, so when they try to see as a uh, reduction in the primary endpoint for the sudden cardiac death, there was, it was not so significant for the West study, so which was with the usage of wearable cardiac uh, defibrillator. Although we are definitely aware, being a non-invasive uh, tool, it, is, it has its own advantages. For example, there's no cutting, there's no risk for bleeding, pneumothorax, and perforations and all, okay? But it has its own limitation as well. Limitation in the sense, you cannot do a pacing for that. You have to, the only therapy, what it can do is giving a bit of shock. And if someone is really having obese, or if someone is having, you know, spinal problems and all, wearing it, or it makes them di discomfortable and all, it's not so advised. So what are the other options which is available as well? So something is called as subcutaneous ICDs. 
so with the subcutaneous icd as the name itself tells it is more of a subcutaneous so tends to avoid the vascular axis so if someone is having a problem with the transvenous leads and all so for example the pocket was infected the pocket was already used up and also th those are the patients where subcutaneous icd can be used we must remember those patients cannot be paced so for example if there is a patient who is having bradycardia episodes as well this is not a that person is not going to be a good candidate for this otherwise similarly if the patient is a candidate for atp anti tachycardia patient otherwise the patient might need any uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy as well especially in the future so they are not the best candidates of course for this and this is more preferred for the channelopathies or the hcm patients as well where in which uh, the mechanism is more like a polymorphic vt and vf and most of the times bradycardia is not there just a shock is all which you need for that even for brugada syndrome as well brugada syndrome yes it seems to be like a good patient right you might not need to pace the problem with them is they may be associated with lot of inappropriate shock and and what is the reason is due to the characteristic of the qrs and t wave morphology so it might be able to oversense and give uh, um, inappropriate shock and it's not good it's not a, a good uh, i would say um, sensation to get those shocks i still remember my teacher used to say so it's more like a horse uh, hitting on your chest with a thud so that's like doom so it's not a pleasant sensation in fact so in summary sudden cardiac death is common if you have you may be able to uh, diagnose it or diagnose those families or those patients if you have a keen eyes for history taking and trying to look for those signs and symptoms in fact you we all can i think we all can identify those high risk patients as well yes even in 21st century when we are thinking to uh, yeah we have already sent a mission to mars or even we are thinking to send a human mission to uh, moon as well but if when we are thinking about its cure possibly we may not be able to cure it but definitely we can give them a slightly better life thank you so much thank you